Okay, so our final panel of the day, uh, titled Mass Torts Cases to Watch in 2023. Um, our moderator will be Neil Hornsway. Uh Neil, the CEO of Optium Capital LLC, the largest purchaser of class action and mass tort claims in the United States. Uh, prior to founding Optium, Neil ran three publicly traded financial companies and was previously a partner in a large national firm. Uh, joined by Neil will be Christopher Eggy, I hope I pronounced that right, um, partner and co-managing partner of the Austin office of Gordon Reese, uh, Mark Evelyn, CEO of uh, Barus LLC, uh, Edward Niger, uh, co-managing partner of Ask LLP, and Bridie Farrell, uh, Senior Advisor of Relationship Management at Milestone. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to try and get everyone to the cocktail party of five minutes early because I know that's what everyone wants to do. All right, uh, we are going to start with uh, Chris Eddy. Chris is co-managing partner of the Austin office of Gordon Reese and has worked in the environmental and toxic tort section of the firm. He has more than 20 years of trial experience and has defended major corporations and mass court action as National Trial Council and National Coordinating Council across the United States. Chris will be discussing current filing and verdict trends in asbestos and tap litigation, judicial hell holes, key opinions, and statutory updates, and the future of the litigation. Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. All right, I'm going to stay. I've been sitting for a while today. All right. All right, so I'm going to start us out. Uh, right here. Just kidding. <laughs> Did I hit the wrong button? We're back. It's all right. Today, uh, I think Neil for introducing me. I think we're going to cover a variety of different topics today, and then we're going to kind of wrap it all up in the end, right? <laughs> okay. So we've covered a lot of different topics today, from cybersecurity to uh, you know gender discrimination, uh, a lot of different topics. And uh, you know, one thing that came to mind: we're supposed to be talking about mass torts here, and one thing that I is you know what were some of the original mass torts um, period in, in, you know, across the United States, and you know one of the main mass torts that started out in this whole business was Agent Orange, um, asbestos litigation, silicon breast implants. There was a really a variety of different um, different topics that started the mass tort litigation. Well. You know, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about asbestos and talk litigation. I'm going to kind of tie in some of the things we've talked about at lunch or the lunch hour, and uh, also just kind of give you some updates on some of the, the trends, some of the uh, filings, and some of the big verdicts, um, just in regard to asbestos and talk litigation in general across the United States right now. Um, okay. So, you know, the big question, lingering question I know in a lot of people's minds is when is asbestos going to end? Um, I've been hearing about it forever. Everybody said it was going to go away 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's still here today. And I, I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, this last year, there were nine verdicts uh, across the United States so far to date. Um, you'll see there was a, a dip in 2020 due to the pandemic. In pre pandemic, you'll see the numbers there were 46 and 66 uh, cases that went to verdict pre-pandemic in the asbestos and talc litigation world. Um, you know, we haven't seen those numbers come quite up, quite up, come back quite yet from pre-pandemic. Um, I think it's been doing part to a lot of nuclear verdicts that we've seen, and I think, frankly, we're still seeing a lot of remote uh, trials, remote. Everybody's you know, afraid to go back in the courtroom really to try these cases just yet. So I think we'll see that increase over the years, but it hasn't gotten back up just yet. Out of the nine verdicts this last year, uh, five 
of the nine verdicts were plaintiff's verdicts, and four of the nine verdicts were actually nuclear verdicts um, this last year. Uh, and we'll cover, I'll cover two or three of those uh, in just a minute. As far as the disease type that comes in the law this type of litigation, with asbestos and talc litigation, it's usually we're seeing some kind of cancer, uh, mesothelioma, lung cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancers. Uh, that has not changed over the years. It's still about 86 percent uh, of the cases we're seeing are mesothelioma cases. Um, we're seeing a little trend in the increase, about 7 percent or so of cases that are ovarian cancer and colon cancer cases, primarily due to the talc claims we're seeing. Average verdict values um, have been on a steady increase over the last three years, about 16 million, 17 million, and around $21 million average verdict this year. Uh, in 2020, there was a big spike in, in the average value due to one case that it was a New Jersey talc case that, where there was a $750 million verdict that kind of skewed those numbers that I hear them, so. Okay, so as far as filings go, how many cases are there? Um, I know everybody's wondering that. But we're seeing uh, about this last year, 3,550 cases were filed, and that was actually a 7% decrease in the number of cases. So, you know, the good news and bad news, the good news is there are, we are seeing a decrease in the filings I think it's about a 17% decrease over the last five years in asbestos filings, but we're seeing, still seeing some big verdicts, and we're seeing, even though we're seeing lower volume, we're seeing higher, higher quality of cases sometimes um, that are being tried. Um, I won't go over all these uh, points here, but just uh, Madison County is still the, the hot spot for this litigation. We're seeing a lot of increased filings in California, specifically in Los Angeles. There was a 50% increase this last year in filings. Uh, that's something to watch. Um, and then, you know, the normal players, so to speak, of plaintiff's farms in this litigation, um, Corey, Simmons, Whites, uh, Monty, there are many, many others, but those are the top filers uh, for the most part of this litigation. Okay, as far as talc cases go, talc exposures within these asbestos cases, uh, we saw a big spike this last year, about a 29% about a 29% increase out filings this last year, in part due to a lot of the Johnson and Johnson and other verdicts that have been coming out. And 11% of all asbestos cases that are being, that are on file are actually talc related cases. I mean, there's 89% of all the other cases are asbestos and talc cases are solely asbestos cases. Madison County, again, is a big jurisdiction uh, for talc cases as well. All right, I'm going to go through a few, three cases that are, that have occurred this year in this litigation. Uh, some asbestos, some talc. This first case is a asbestos only case that took place in Los Angeles, California. Uh, the White Luxembourg firm tried the case. They received a $40 million verdict. Um, for the most part, this was a standard uh, asbestos case out in Los Angeles. Uh, the verdict was higher than the average verdicts that came out, um, but you know I think we're seeing a trend in more and more cases going to Los Angeles uh, and going in California. I think we're going to see, continue to see some big verdicts in California uh, for these cases. And as the talc cases grow up, we're going to see more of the talc cases out that way as well. One other uh, jurisdiction that we had, kind of an outlier jurisdiction, is Connecticut. There's a $20 million verdict in Connecticut just a few months ago, um, which is really unforeseen to a certain extent. We haven't seen, uh, it's the largest verdict, asbestos verdict, at least in Connecticut state. Uh, Washington Krause tried the case and involved a 76-year-old deceased plaintiff. Um, that case is currently on appeal. Um, and, you know, Connecticut, backing up, you know, I was also going to talk about judicial hell holes. Uh, Connecticut's not one of the, the uh, states on the judicial, official judicial list. Although I think this morning Gerald had mentioned he actually used the phrase epicenter as opposed to judicial hellhole, which is probably a little politically correct. <laughs> so, but there is an official report out there called the Judicial Hellhole Report. Uh, California, I believe, is number three on the list. Um, Georgia, of all places, is number one. Pennsylvania is number two. Uh, 
And then South Carolina is number six on the list. Uh, and this is this kind of ties in with our lunch meeting today involving Whitaker Park and Daniels. This was a big verdict that came out. Uh, the Dino Mark firm, which is a Texas firm, where I'm from, tried the case in South Carolina um, in front of Judge Toll. Uh, they received a $29 million verdict. And a few days after the verdict came out, Judge Toll appointed a receiver for Whitaker Park and Daniels. And Whitaker Park and Daniels had no assets, nothing in South Carolina at all. And a few weeks later, Whitaker Park uh, Filed for bankruptcy protection in New Jersey, as they mentioned today at lunch. Um, so, this is just another jurisdiction to watch. Uh, this was a, uh, it was a talc based case. Um, the previous case, actually, I meant to mention in Connecticut, this was actually an industrial talc case. Um, we've heard a lot in the news about cosmetic talc cases, um, but these industrial talc cases are also out there. And they're not going into cosmetic products that put in the face of your body. Uh, they went into, in this particular case, it was a talc uh, product, or talc went into uh, DAP, or humanable talc, talc went into DAP caulking products that were put around windows, window lids. And the, uh, anyways, the plaintiff in this, this case was awarded $20 million for that exposure. Okay, I'm going to jump to trends in the litigation. As I just mentioned, we're seeing a, a big spike in this asbestos talc litigation with the contaminated talc cases, the industrial talc cases, and we're seeing a lot more uh, in, the, in the past. And you know, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. You know, we've seen a lot of cases with alleged exposures in the 60s and 70s. We're starting to see a lot more cases now in the 80s, 90s. I think we're going to continue to see it in the 2000s and beyond, which really, uh, you know, it's hard to comprehend because that just the, the the exposure to a really had limited type of products that contained out back in the end of the 80s and 90s and, and onward. It's, it's really unlimited. Uh, there's a lot of products out there that we're going to see that are going to face some, some like third, fourth, fifth tier uh, defendants are going to be uh, you know, face lawsuits in this litigation. Um, we're also seeing a, a, an increased trend in corporate restructuring and buyouts in the asbestos and doubt world. Uh, we're seeing private equity firms come in and buy out distressed uh, liability companies, companies, asbestos companies, company talc companies, middle market companies, and we're seeing a lot of private equity firms come into this this market and try to take advantage and try to help the companies rebuild and, and get them through the litigation. Um, we're also seeing a spike in defense attorneys, at least, using what's called the idiopathic or spontaneous defense at trial. And what is that? Basically, it's a fancy word for meaning unknown cause. We don't know what it is. There's just a genetic propensity for a certain amount of people in the population to get the disease, and we think that's how you got the disease. Uh, and perhaps that come, come about because defense attorneys in particular, it's harder and harder these days to get other types of like, other exposures on the jury form in a lot of jurisdictions. They're really limiting us to, to getting all the the guy was in the Navy getting the Navy exposures, the insulation exposures that we typically in the past did uh, kind of point fingers at. So this is kind of a result of a trend in the litigation. All right, some key procedural and statutory updates I want to briefly mention. Um, these have been around for a while. Uh, the bankruptcy trust transparency the laws are, are currently in place in about 16 different states. Uh, there hasn't been any real movement on getting any more states on the list since about 2019. And that just enables defense attorneys, the plaintiff's attorneys were obligated to reveal what bankrupt trust companies they're filing claims with um, to the defense attorneys, which are the, the, the defense part. Over the same, in the same breath, overnaming statutes are in place in five states in the US. Um, that's, that happened between 2020 and 2022. Um, and we've seen a, uh, we haven't seen really uh, any, any updates there. I think there's a statute pending in New York currently, or a proposal in New York, but I don't think it's taken off just yet. Um, and lastly, since we're in New York, I thought it was worthwhile mentioning uh, that there is a, uh, there was a special master appointed here in New York for the asbestos and talc litigation. And he recently, in the last month or so, has ordered some pretty extensive um, punitive damage discovery early on in cases. Um, it's pretty ominous on at least defendants. 
um, to answer, and we'll see where that goes. That hasn't uh, really played out yet. That's something to watch here in New York City. All right, I'm going to wrap up with these two. Uh, one thing I think uh, was mentioned this morning, personal jurisdiction um, is a big thing in this litigation of keeping certain cases out of certain states out where they don't belong. Um, one big case to watch this year that's currently pending before the United States Supreme Court is Mallory, Mallory versus Norfolk. Um, Mallory sued Norfolk Southern Railway in Pennsylvania. Um, all the alleged exposure were in two other states. Uh, Pennsylvania has a statute that says if you register to do business in that state, then you consent to jurisdiction in that state. So the question before the United States Supreme Court right now is, is it sufficient to be registered to do business in a state to submit to jurisdiction in that state? So that's, uh, it's going to have a wide-ranging effect on defendants in this litigation and other litigation as well. Uh, you know, it's a, you know, overturn Bristol Myers and Goodyear and uh, other, other cases that are out there that, that help us keep certain case out of certain states. And finally, I'm going to wrap up with just mentioning for those that are familiar with California, uh, have cases in California. California has very, it's just important bills in the Supreme Court of California recently enacted pretty stringent standards on uh, using, utilizing corporate representatives uh, at trial in those cases. Uh, the Bar Baratarian case uh, significant, significantly limits prior deposition testimony. Um, in cases where there wasn't a ample opportunity to cross-examine cross the corporate rep as if they were going to trial. Um, and then the Ramirez case hits on personal knowledge of the corporate rep. The corporate representative that you want to testify for your company isn't, doesn't have personal knowledge, then they're not allowed to testify about it. So, in practically speaking, if you have a corporate rep that's born in 1970, and he's asked to testify about the company's actions going back to the 1960s and 1970s. You know, how's he going to do that? He's not going to clearly have personal knowledge. For years, we've trained corporate reps that were born, you know, later years. Some were born in earlier years. And we've, we've educated them on, how the, on what the company did or didn't do during certain time frames. And that's going to really change the landscape of how we present corporate representatives in California for those cases. So, with that, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next, we have Edward Niners, and to my left, uh, Ed's co-managing partner of Ask LLP, a law firm specializing in prosecuting mass torts and bankruptcy, especially in situations in which mass torts and bankruptcy converge. Ed, thank you. Sure. Can we just have next slide, just sitting on either one? Keeping you from your drinks. Okay. First of all, thank you. That was really interesting. I don't know if um, there's a question and answer session afterwards, but uh, I thought the $40 million verdict in a case where you said uh, there wasn't anything uh, significant it is really interesting. I just wondering why you think that is. Um, but we can do that after. Uh, <laughs> Happy to explain that. <laughs> you could do it now, too. Well, it was it was a typical case in, in, in Los Angeles because it was involving a uh, Emerson Electric, which is a large electrical company, and the plaintiff there was uh, you know this deceased, I think, 86 year old man. Um, we see occasionally in these cases, and uh, you know it was it was alleged exposure while he was working around electrical products that had that were insulated. Right, but he lived to be 86. Right. So uh, I just don't get it. Yeah. We say well. <laughs> I, I got to be more asbestos cases. Uh, okay, so I'm, my job is to talk about. I'm not going to add any time to the clock. My job is to talk about uh, opioids, opioid litigation, especially the opioids and bankruptcy, which has been um, my life uh, for the last five years. Uh, I represent about sixty thousand clients overall. Some in Purdue, some in Mount Um so I'm an endo. And I got into it because all the big law firms were representing the states and municipalities suing Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family for their role in the uh, opioid crisis, causing the opioid crisis. 
and no one was representing, for whatever reason, uh, the actual individual human victims. And billions and billions of dollars were going to states and municipalities. They weren't even doing anything with that money. They weren't, they weren't putting it towards payment. They were just using it to fill budget gaps. And uh, the individual victims continued to suffer. There, were no, there was no Narcan, there's no rehab, there's no uh, addiction services. Uh, and as you can probably imagine, poverty and addiction go hand in hand with each other. So, and one causes the other. Poverty causes addiction, addiction causes poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but there was no one speaking out for them. Uh, so I decided that I'm, I'm a bankruptcy lawyer, Purdue filed for bankruptcy, and I'm gonna try to represent them. Within, within a year, I believe, the, and when I say we, I don't just mean my law firm, but one of the th things about mass courts as opposed to class action uh, is that a lot of law firms work together and there's shared clients and there's firms that get the client, firms that uh, refer to the client, fir firms that actually represent the client in court, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the conglomerate of firms representing individuals, uh, those firms represented about 60,000 uh, individual victims whom I then represented in the bankruptcy. And when Purdue filed for bankruptcy in September of 2019, gosh, it feels, it feels like yesterday, but it's been, it's been four plus years, uh, no one was representing uh, the victims in the litigations that caused Purdue to file for bankruptcy. It was all states and municipalities uh, represented by the largest uh, plaintiff's firms. And they went in with a deal to hand over Purdue to these states and also the Sacros are going to chip in another two point something billion to get what's called a non-consensual third party release, which is the hottest uh, topic in bankruptcy right now. And essentially what that is, is bankruptcy allows a debtor to exit bankruptcy with an injunction against lawsuits against the debtor. In other words, all those people are suing you, you file for bankruptcy, you confirm a plan of your organization, that plan contains an injunction against anyone suing you ever again, and that's the purpose of bankruptcy, especially in mass tort situations. A non consensual third party release is when someone else chips in money, someone else who did not file for bankruptcy chips in money to the bankruptcy plan, they get uh, a release. They don't get an injunction under the code, but they get a release in the, in the confirmation order. And the argument is, the argument against that is, that they didn't file for bankruptcy, they should get the benefit of bankruptcy. The argument for that is, uh, there's two arguments. One is a moral argument, the other one is a legal argument. The legal argument is that they're not necessarily getting the injunction envisioned by bankruptcy. They're getting a release, which is not what the bankruptcy code is talking about and what debtors get. And the bankruptcy code also says that the, the bankruptcy judge can uh, enter any order that is required to uh, confirm a plan of reorganization. So what the debtor and the party seeking the third party release has to prove is that without that release, the debtor would not be able to reorganize, which was certainly the case in Purdue Pharma, because uh, Purdue itself was valued at about 1.5 billion. That would never be enough for the states and municipalities, and certainly not enough for me. And uh, we needed the Sackler money in order to confirm the plan. Uh, See how I cram it four years into four minutes. Um, so that was essentially the plan going in. Uh, once Purdue filed, we realized that the Sacros and Purdue didn't really care where the money went to, but of course they got their releases and, and could come out of bankruptcy. So it ended up being a fight between the actual victims and the states and the state attorneys general who purported to represent the actual victims over who gets the money. We said that the victims said that we should get the money. Uh, and obviously the state said, no, they should get the money. And some, some politicians said the most horrible things about that there was something to the effect of uh, if, if the victims get the money, then they're just gonna use it to buy more drugs. And uh, our legal arguments for getting the money, the moral arguments are obvious, so I'm not even going to tell it to anyone. The legal arguments for us getting the money is they didn't actually prove that Purdue caused the opioid crisis that was never proven in court and ruled on. 
whereas each and every one of our victims have a prescription for an Oxycontin product. So there's a much more causal uh, relationship between us and Purdue. There's a direct connection between us and Purdue, whereas the states have to come on to a whole bunch of steps. You know, Purdue did this, Purdue did that, and that led to this, and this led to that, and that caused more crime, and it caused more you know, stuff to clean up. So it wasn't really direct. Um, we had another very strong argument, and I'm forgetting what it is, but they leave just as well because uh, we're running out of time. Long story short, bankruptcy court uh, confirmed the plan and gave the Sackler their releases. The Sacklers their releases after the Sacklers agreed to uh, allow the victims to confront them, put in another $2 million, and create a, uh, a document depository with about 50 million uh, priorly never unseen classified documents. Bankruptcy judge, uh, Judge String, confirmed the plan. He was uh, a really uh, uh, assaulted emotionally and verbally by people who were against the plan, and long, not long after he confirmed the plan, he announced his retirement, and he is now going to uh, be a bankruptcy lawyer at Skadden. And I don't blame him because he really suffered uh, unreasonably uh, harsh attacks, and he was just trying to do the best thing, uh, and in a very difficult situation. Right on one hand, you have victims who say, "Well, the Sanders should get releases. I don't want to forgive them." But on the other hand, the money, and I forgot to say this, the money that uh, Purdue was going to uh, give to the victims, which is another, which is another thing I forgot to say, we ended up getting 750 million and the states ended up getting uh, 4 point something billion. Um, all the money that the states get has to be used to a big opioid crisis. So on the one hand, you have, let's say, a mom who lost a child saying, well, I don't want the sacrifice to get on scot free, but on the other hand, she also doesn't want anyone to suffer like she did. So that was the difficult thing that Judge Strait had to deal with in the bankruptcy, and it was a no-win situation. Okay. Uh, Judge Strait was overruled by the district court, Judge McMahon. Uh, the, we, then, us, I mean, I mean the victims, the states, because we are now all, all on one side, because we settled, and the debtors, appealed that to the Second Circuit, we had an oral argument April 29, 2022, so it's been over a year since we have been waiting for a decision from the Second Circuit on non consensual third party releases. And who is appealing it? It's the United States government, the Department of Justice. So they are the ones who are standing in the way of the victims getting their money and four point something billion dollars going to states to abate the opioid crisis, which is ridiculous because uh, Joe Biden in almost every state of the union said, that he wants to abate the opioid crisis, and recently he allowed $1.5 billion to go to the states to abate the opioid crisis. But if he would just allow the settlement to go through, or if his Justice Department would allow the settlement to go through, then the states would get four, three times that now. And uh, we actually had a thousand victims. I could have been done if not for answer to this. We're, we're waiting to the Court of Appeals, and it's, it's, it's a really tragic thing because 300 people have died of overdose every single day, and the reason they're waiting and not getting any help is because of the Department of Justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. That was great. Uh, next, we have Bridie Burrell. Uh, she's an advocate on behalf of crime victims and survivors of abuse and exploitation. Uh, I'm sure you've seen her on TV from time to time. She's a frequent commentator in the media and a distinguished speaker about issues related to abuse. Bridie was a nationally ranked speed skater at the age of 15 when she was sexually abused by her 33-year-old uh, Olympic silver medalist teammate. She publicly disclosed the abuse in 2013 and subsequently gave up her career in finance to commit herself to the cause of abuse. I'm sorry, to commit herself to the cause of abuse survivors and crime victims. Uh, Bridie is dedicated to improving the life cycle of the survivor through the work of her nonprofit, uh, American Love Kids, to her firm, Aiken, Burrell, and Kraloff, to the offboarding with, uh, with trauma uh, informed partners. She's trying to make the journey of speaking up and proceeding with litigation a better experience for the next survivor. Uh, Brandy? Thanks. 
Uh, hi, everyone. I, too, promise to stay on time. Uh, so I'm Brian, you've heard from me introduction. Um, what brings me into this space is my own experience of child sexual abuse and not speaking up about it for so long. When I did come forward in 2013 and I met with the CEO of the United States Olympic Committee, he uh, told me to go back to New York and press charges, to which I explained to him that the statute of limitation had expired and so that wasn't an option. Uh, he also told me that he would work with me to do whatever he could, and um, I asked him what he could do to get my abuser out of you know, speed skating and US Hall of Fame, and he said nothing. And then he also said that when athletes come forward, not if, but when athletes come forward, to please send them to him and safe sport rather than going to the media and speaking like I did. And I turned and I looked him in the eye and I said, Scott, I don't trust you. And here I am, over 10 years later, um, as I was sitting here during our last session, I got another 20-page email from Defense asking me more and more questions. Um, and what brings me here to these conferences and what keeps me in this world is that um, the process is really hard. And while I think that most of the lawyers are doing it for the right reasons, I think the individual can frequently get lost in that process. And so what I want to do is make it as uh, less painful as possible. I don't think it's ever going to be, quote, a fun experience. Um, and so what I work on right now really is the, what I call the life cycle of the survivor. So that starts with creating law that will include as many people as possible. Um, when Mr. Blackman said go back to New York, I did just that. I uh, worked for seven years on the Child Victims Act, which we ultimately passed, which allowed survivors like myself, whose statute had expired, to come forward and sue both our abuser and the institutions that covered it up which is super, super important. So, uh, for example, in Georgia, they passed a bill, I think it's maybe about 10 years ago now, and it was just against the abuser. So maybe 11 people filed, it did nothing, right? My case, um, Andy Abel, my abuser, was first reported to uh, USB Skating in the Olympic Committee in 1989 when I was in kindergarten and was unable to tie my ice skates. He raped his first person. I was in 1997. Like, our paths should not have ever crossed. And so you have to create legislation that holds the institution accountable as well. Um, finding a lawyer was a very informative process, shall I say. And so I want to make that process uh, easier and more streamlined for other people. I think that. There are all sorts of lawyers out there. There's some that are uh, attack dogs, and if that's what you want, then we can get you that. If it's something that you want to be in the background and you want to be a complete Jane or John Doe, we can work with you on that as well. Um, and make sure that that process of that whole intake is as trauma-informed as, as possible, as Mark will talk about it as well. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I called firms that you know, they're like, well, if you weren't a gymnast, why are you calling me and hung up on me 10 years ago, right? So there's a lot that can improve on the, um, the interfacing between the, the firm and the survivor. Um, and what I'm doing now is working also on the, the end of that life cycle and back to kind of my financial roots where when um, there is a case that's resolved, like, for example, uh, the opioid epidemic or the uh, Boy Scouts of America, and you have these distributions that are going out to clients to be cognizant of who they're going to, and um, not because they're going to use the money like some of our politicians are using them, but rather that you have a check coming to a family for $50,000. What does that do to that family in terms of um, their children's FAFSA? in terms of other subsidies that they're receiving. And so making sure that when, especially this population of people gets that income, that it's done properly and respectfully. The second thing is that to walk in, especially on the sexual assault side with um, women like myself, to have to walk into a financial advisor to like your dad's guy or your husband's frat buddy and say, I have 100,000 or a million dollars here from 
being raped. Like nobody wants to do that. And so um, having someone being able to send those survivors to someone that answers the phone and you don't have to go through the whole story again and explain the whole thing. I have one survivor who had a check come in and she called me, I didn't know her. She called me and said, Brian, I don't want the money, I'm giving it to your to your nonprofit America Loves Kids. And I said, sure, you know, write the check and mail it to me in two years. Like take time to think about it. Um, and while the the idea of the judicial system is to try and make one whole again, this is hardly a patch to the abuse that occurred as well as the entire freaking system that you go through to get this end result. So um, start to finish, that's what I work on. For example, this morning when we were at a press conference across the street from uh, the courthouse where Ms. Carroll's case is being tried because there's an adult survivor act that's active in New York State and there's only six months for survivors to come forward. Um, and so it's a lot of reaching out to people and, and encouraging them to come forward while also, simultaneously, uh, I'm honest with people, and so I will tell potential clients how awful the system is and that they might want to run for the hills. Um, but I think that's really important for people to uh, have an understanding of what the heck they're, they're getting involved in. So I'm under time, because I was a speed skater. So <laughs> I'll give the time up for questions at the end. Thanks, Roger. That was great. Okay. Uh, next up, we have Mark Evelyn. Mark is the CEO and one of the founders of Terrace, a full service litigation support provider established in 2004. His team has supported law firms representing claimants in some of the largest mass courts in history, including asbestos, talent, 3 m earplugs, roundup, and sexual abuse cases. Uh, Mark will be discussing the need to improve the engagement of claimants throughout the mass court process. And before I start, I just want to say what she said, because I think you've taken a lot of my talking points and what really drives me, motivates me and my team. Um, I've been involved in mass courts since about 1992. I got involved in the asbestos litigation on the defense side, uh, working for a little outfit called the Center for Claims Resolution just a month before they filed uh, the Georgie class action, which was supposed to end the asbestos litigation then, then and there. It didn't, uh, obviously, because here we are 30 years later. Um, but since that first day on the job, I've noticed that our civil justice system is fundamentally flawed in a key respect. Um, all credit due to lawyers who do uh, great work advocating for their clients, for both victims uh, and for defendants who also deserve representation. Um, but our legal system needs to become far more people-centered. We are dealing with people who have uh, come forward and decided to bring cases uh, um, knowing full well that they may not uh, prevail. And they are put through the ringer. Um, I've noticed since I first got involved that there's very little time and um, often it's no fault of lawyers, but very little time spent on explaining to individuals what the process entails, what they are going to go through when they sign that retainer letter, and what rights, in the case of class actions, they may be giving up if they decide to participate in class action. What rights they may be giving up if they decide to approve the bankruptcy. And those, those forms of settlement, all legitimate forms in the right situations, but claimants get very little time from the lawyers who are so focused on litigating to actually explain to them what is happening. And it's their rights that we're talking about. It's their trauma that we are working on resolving. Um, and, and I think we need to spend more, far more time talking about those things and educating the legal professional on how to handle people with sensitivity, how to approach them where they are, and how to deal with them as humans first and as clients second. Um, one of the things that Brighty touched on is my team is very focused on bringing to bear professionals who come from areas outside of litigation who can actually relate to these individuals who are uh, choosing to bring their cases forward. Um, in the case of sexual abuse cases, that may mean hiring social workers, case workers who are trained in trauma-informed care. 
in the case of, say, um, an emerging MDL that's happening right now, heating up the, uh, the hair relaxer or hair straightener cases, it means hiring people who can talk to the claimants who they can actually relate to. So hiring more African American women to talk to those people. So there's somebody across the table who they can look in the eye and know that this person gets me, this person understands me. Um, I don't want to get into any of the legal nuts and bolts, but that's basically where I'm coming from, what, I, what is driving me in. And I'm looking to partner with people who are looking to change the system for the better. And I have a lot of opinions about other things that <laughs> so I'm happy to cede my time to talk about those things. All right. Thanks, Mark. Okay, I'm going to finish this up by talking about early liquidity opportunities for class action plaintiffs and mass court plaintiffs. And I don't know about all of you, but it sure seems to me that uh, the lifespan of the lawsuits keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And as an example, probably the best one I could come up with because I've lived with this now for quite some time, the Visa MasterCard interchange case. Uh, if you don't know what the interchange fee is, every time you walk into a store, you hand your Visa or MasterCard to the merchant, the merchant swipes the card, and has to pay a 1% to 3% fee, on average, uh, to Visa or MasterCard. Well, back in the late 1990s, Visa and MasterCard got together for a meeting, and they came up with the idea, which was something like, hey, why don't we both raise our interchange fees together at the same time? We'll both make more money which was absolutely a brilliant idea if it weren't a violation of the Sherman Act. But they had a meeting, they, they raised the uh, pricing, and in 2004, they were sued in a reported class of action. Uh, they admitted they did it. I say there were emails documenting that, but they had you know handwritten memoranda back then uh, documenting everything. And you'd think this would be you know a two to three year type of case. Well. In 2012, eight years after the case was originally filed, we reached our first settlement in Visa MasterCard. That was $7.4 billion, so it was a, a large case. That settlement was appealed in 2013. In 2016, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the settlement uh, due to a conflict of issue, conflict of interest issue, believe it or not. So in 2017 and 2018, we were back at it one more time and reached a new settlement in early 2019. You're right, it was appealed again to the Second Circuit Court of Appeal. We had COVID hit at this point. It was like a fun time for everyone. And just uh, two months ago, in March of 2023, the Second Circuit affirmed the settlement, at least most of the settlement. A rehearing uh, petition was denied by the Second Circuit, so the objectors are now going to be filing uh, for a cert writ with the U.S. Supreme Court. They have 90 days to do that, and if you calculate the math, we all know that the Supremes get a nice vacation every summer, so the earliest the uh, Supreme Court is going to act on this will be in the fall of uh, this year. Now, think, how many possible plaintiffs could you have in one? These cases. The original case had 12 million merchants as class members. The revised case, because the class period changed, we now have 16 million merchants as class members. So as this goes on and on and on, you have to think maybe one or two of the 16 million, had they been given the choice 20 years earlier, hey, I know this has found money for you. Um, what do you think? Um, you could either play litigation roulette and then you'll either win or you lose, or a claim purchasing company such as Optium uh, will buy your claim right now on a non recourse basis. In other words, if the case turns out to be a loser, you don't have to pay us back. And you can put the proceeds of that, uh, that purchase uh, into your core business. A lot of plaintiffs want to do this, and uh, over the years they've been told it's a questionable practice. Well, now it's, it's not so questionable anymore. Um, can you do it? The answer is yes. 
This all goes back, and I really apologize to the lawyers that are still in the room, to an old English common law doctrine called champerty. Now, champerty prohibited agreements in which a stranger to a lawsuit agrees to assist the, in the prosecution of the lawsuit in exchange for a portion of the proceeds, usually a percentage. Oh, that sounds bad, huh? You know what that sounds like to me? A contingency fee. Let's, let's run through this. Okay, we have a stranger to a lawsuit, that would be the lawyer, agrees to help in the prosecution of the lawsuit, okay, in exchange for a percentage fee. Sounds to me like contention fees are champerty. In the United States, every state in the union has adopted a provision to make sure they're not counted as champerty. But in Great Britain, for example, one of my favorite places to read opinions, I'm going to read you a quote about champerty in a second from Great Britain. Uh, up until 2013, the courts unanimously ruled in Great Britain that contingent fees were champerty and therefore could not be honored until the legislation was finally passed in 2013. Now, what's so bad about champerty, you might ask? Well, again, I could read you something boring from the Second Circuit here or something really interesting from a um, uh, high court in England. And what they say is the doctrine was developed a common law to prevent officious intermeddlers from stirring up strife and contention by vexatious and speculative litigation, which would disturb the peace of society, lead to corrupt practices, and prevent the remedial process of the law. Who could argue with that? Well, about two-thirds of the states in the United States could argue with that because those states have either repudiated the doctrine of chambery or they never uh, had it in the first place. But that leaves us with one-third of the states that still have some vestige of chambery, and those are the states where it's a challenge. And you know, since we're all sitting in New York right now, why don't we pick on New York? Uh, New York has uh, Section 489, uh, the New York uh, Judiciary uh, Law, which says, prohibits persons and corporate entities from buying or taking an assignment of any claim or demand, and here's the key part, with the intent and for the purpose of bringing an action or proceeding thereon. So in other words, Champerty itself isn't bad, and the wrong that they were trying to address all the way back to the Roman Empire was someone out there was rich and had money and wanted to go to someone that might have a claim for the purpose of bringing new litigation and splitting the proceeds. But at least for the last 15 years, claim filing companies uh, never, ever, ever uh, attempt to buy a claim where the lawsuit hasn't been filed yet. All we do simply is we look at cases that are already filed and we we offer up, if you would like to sell your claim, we'd be happy to uh, negotiate that and buy it from you. So that seems to work uh, pretty darn well. Again, the claim purchases are on a non-recourse basis, which means if the case goes the wrong way, you don't have to pay us back. If the spreadsheets that we calculate turned out to be wrong and there's a shortage, you don't have to pay us back or any other claim uh, companies that are out there uh, for right now. In class action settlements, uh, claim, uh, claim purchasing companies will generally purchase 100% of the claim. It's a very simple transaction. Generally, lead counsel in class actions love that because the class gets a bit more consolidated than it was. And quite frankly, lead counsel uh, doesn't get angst from people saying, why is this case going on for 12 years, 15 years, 20 years? So they like that. Now in mass court situations, it's a little more problematic, but we do buy, uh, we do buy claims, and other claim filing, co claim purchasing companies do buy claims in that situation. But we'll only buy 40 to 70 percent of the claim. And the reason why we do that is, unlike in a class action, there could be deposition obligations, there could be interrogatories, uh, any type of discovery or need for additional documentation. So in the end, 
allowing companies to buy claims provides a service to a lot of litigants out there that would love to get money that's owed to them and they don't have to wait 20 years to get it. Okay, any questions for any of the panels? Well, I think you should get some. <laughs> Panel, want to do a wave before questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, got one in the back. Related to the, the claim this purchasing. And first of all, thank you for clarifying that Champerty is only the dealing claims before they're filed. That, that's a load up of mine. Thank you. So, um, first of all, uh, what do you make of the two trends? Number one, of a lot of um, claims purchasing companies having non-lawyers evaluating the cases, right? Is there any sort of secret sauce there, or is it just uh, that they're so conservative in their assumptions that they're sure that they're, they're doing a, a good deal at any given time? That's, that's number one. And then number two, and relatedly, uh, with the growth of the industry, because the returns are non-correlated to the market, right? The investors are always looking for non-correlated returns. Uh, the market has been growing and growing and growing with respect to the assets under management in this sort of industry. Uh, has there been a corresponding trend in the cost, or the, the cost of accessing the money coming down, or the, the yields to the sellers coming up over over time? Just curious what your observations are. Sure. Well, to answer the first question, our secret weapon is my partner Tony Raleigh, who's sitting right over there at the table. Tony. <laughs> you know, you, you raise a corollary question as, as well that just came to mind. You know, litigation finance companies, what do they do? Litigation finance companies give money in many instances to bring lawsuits, and because of that, they will only operate with choice of law in a state that does not recognize chamber. In other states, there's been quite a bit of uh, litigation with respect to that. Five minutes? Okay, we'll finish in three. All right, um, and, and then in, in terms of competition and more companies having assets under management, obviously the earlier you are in the claims process, you have the most risk, right? For example, in a, in a class action, what if the class isn't certified? So before a class is certified, we will pay less than after a class has been certified. Uh, we constantly evaluate, evaluate the merits of the litigation. We do a lot of antitrust uh, purchasing because, as all of you know, in uh, antitrust action, defendants have to pay treble damages or triple damages. As a result, most of those cases will settle. So that takes away at least some of the risk I have to be good enough to pick out what 93 or 94% of these, right? Okay. And um, other companies do the same. But as, as the cases get closer to maturity, for example, Visa MasterCard right now, we're now at a point where we have the Second Circuit uh, affirming most of the settlement. So if we're going to be continue to buy cases, given the fact the uncertainty is lessened, we're going to be paying more at that point for claims than we would five years ago. 10 years ago. Can I ask your question? Uh, I think more or less, uh, but you didn't quite touch upon what's happening overall with respect to the price of money. Is the price of money coming down or are the prices of planes going up? Uh, I would say the price of money is definitely not coming down. Um, I don't know if you've noticed we have a rising interest rate environment <laughs> at this point. Um, but again, I, I see the, the pricing on claims being based more on longevity of the case as opposed to the cost of money. There is some of that, of course. Can you imagine taking out a loan for 22 years on Visa MasterCard, for example? But the way we've, we've structured our capital is we're more or less immune from that uh, type of risk. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Name of my what, sister. Who are the typical investors in these cases? Where, where does the capital come from to purchase these land? Uh, it comes from all over, actually. Uh, there's no shortage of capital out there um, for companies that at least are established. But, um, it comes from uh, a lot of hedge funds, um, very, very large. 
very large mutual fund companies that I'm prohibited from disclosing with an NDA. But if you think about it, this is the perfect investment in a choppy market because guess what? We are not tied to the market at all, at all. So firms want to place some money in a different type of bucket and be immune from interest rate risk. This is where you place it. Anything else? Okay, well thank you everyone. It's cocktail time.